I'm here today with JT from ABCs of Attraction. We've been doing podcasts together for a long time. Yeah, we've known each other for a decade, I think. I know. <laughs> it's all. It all started when he picked me up at a bar. Like literally picked you up because I approached you like Isabel, like, and I said, "You look like Katy Perry," and thus a decade-long friendship. I don't get it as much anymore, but. Who knows? If I spotted you, maybe you would say it at Isabel. Yeah, I still think you look like Katy Perry. Yeah, you she looks like it. herself again. She had the blonde thing going on for a while. Oh, okay. Everyone had like the COVID look. Yes, during COVID, I was like, unfortunately hit like 201 pounds. Now I'm like officially lost 50 pounds. But that was a dark time, you know, for a lot of people. Well, there was but, nothing else to do but eat. Yeah, I mean, I was like dating over during COVID and like, what are you going to do? Stay home, eat, stay in. And then I just got fatter and fatter until finally I was like, one day I was like, oh, you know what? I think it's time for me to lose some weight. And now you're in your fitness era. I am. I call it like my jock era. So losing the first 30 pounds was actually pretty easy. I just like established a normal sort of like routine of going to the gym, um, had a free gym. So it was really easy walking the stairs, doing just maintenance calories instead of eating like 3000 calories. 10 pounds after that, okay, now I had to get really more strict. I had to start counting my calories, mm -hmm. you know, knowing my macros, went to like a real gym, um, started throwing cardio, but the last 10, that was just sheer willpower. Just the mental discipline, just the hungry signal, just going to like a caloric deficit. Because at this point, it's taken a year for me to lose 50 pounds. That's so. pretty good though. It is, but like the last, like I respect all the men and women that are able to get like full six pack because you can start to see a little bit of definition on mine but i'm like okay that last five pounds was just so tough because it's emotional discipline yeah and you kind of are like looking good enough so you're like what's why do i need to try this hard to lose yeah. the last five but hopefully i'll get um a full six pack by the time of your tour when i go overseas with the students and we do it's like I call it the number one inner game experiential event for asian men where we help our guys not only like talk to like tall, beautiful, white European women, but we help them with their emotional self-awareness, their you know emotional regulation, and just what we call like inner confidence, their inner game. Because a lot of guys unfortunately have a lot of sexual shame, um, a lot of internalized racism, and just don't believe that they're good enough to date outside of the race. Do you think it's easier to pick up women overseas than America? Yes, uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that there is just less racism internationally. Now, I'm not saying like Europe, I mean, Latin America, they don't have racism against Asians. Obviously, they do, but not to the same magnitude as, let's say, America. America is what I call like a race-based society, while over in Europe, it's more about class. What class are you? White collar, blue collar, old money, new money. And unfortunately, there's, I, I grew up in America, born and raised in mm -hmm. Texas. Like, I remember dealing with racism all the time. And I have like so many stories of both like white guys and like white girls and other races just being incredibly like racist towards Asians as opposed to like we take our guys overseas. And again, it exists, but not to the same degree. In some places, actually, it's an advantage being Asian. It isn't just neutral, but we have an advantage. Which places are those? Well, you have to sign up for the Euro Tour, and Ooh. then I'll tell you. It's a secret. Do you also have a Latin tour coming up? Yes. The Latin tour is like what we call like a great um, romantic adventure. In this case, of we course. concentrate more on like the romance side. Uh, we just got back from it a few months ago. And of the guys, we had like 3,200 matches and 28 romances. Wait, why, why is that? Why is it more romance-focused? Well... In like Latin culture, the men and the women are more romantic. They're much more sensual. They're more willing to act on that. And it's okay to be romantic. Like in Euro to Latin tour, like I tell the guys, it's okay to buy girls flowers. It's completely acceptable, that act of chivalry and romance. It doesn't really work in America. What? It doesn't? It doesn't. At least on the initial like phases of attraction. When you're dating, sure. But not in the beginning. Like there have been so many times like I've literally bought girls flowers she breaks up with me right well, away. Well, yeah, the first date, they yeah. probably don't want flowers. Yeah, or even like there's a girl, like, I we had been sleeping together, you know, kind of turning a little bit more than that, but it was still early days, and her grandfather passed away. So I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll buy her flowers, say my condolences, 
And you know, like the next day, she, she, she thought it was like coming on too hard. I think that's totally acceptable. That's what I thought. This was just a weird girl. Don't put us all in that box. Yeah, but there is a difference. You have to when admit, someone there dies, is a you give them flowers. That's what that I thought. That was protocol. Yeah, that's what I thought. But there is a difference between how American women date versus how women date internationally. Do you encourage men to buy a rose from the vendors outside the nightclubs? Not here in America. Like that's not something that you do. But like I, I did this in Greece and you were on a date, I bought her roses. She loved it. Absolutely loved it. Everything's again, more romantic overseas. Yeah. Like America it's all about work. Well, I think that overseas there's still more of a belief in like traditional gender roles and how men should and women should act on a date and in relationships. It's more clearly defined while as opposed to America, these things are evolving into kind of a different state of being. I'm not saying that one thing is necessarily better than the other. I'm just saying it's it's different now and we have to adjust. You mm. drop me into any country um, and I'll learn the, how dating works in a couple of days and I can be successful. America, I'm just saying, is different than overseas. Whether good, bad, that's up to the guy to decide. Since your clients are coming to you to learn about dating, do you find that it's harder to teach them the romantic way or is it easier? Because these are guys that I'm guessing are inexperienced in, a lot, in having a relationship at all. So is it easier for them to adjust to the American way of dating or is it easier for them to go all out and do the more like Latin America style? I always encourage guys to accept the challenge. It's more fun. And if you can be good in like a big city like LA, New York, and America, you'll be good anywhere. Like yeah. this is like a test of character and skill because there's nothing more of a brutal, wide awakening than you going out infield, talking to real people real time and getting immediate feedback as to how well you're doing. You know, the thing about like online, for example, is okay, maybe you take great pictures, but you still suck in person. <laughs> like you're still boring or you're not physically attractive. And so I would say like learning self improvement, self development, communication skills, emotional self regulation are important because you can be good here, you can be good anywhere in the world. How do you teach people to have a personality that don't? Because I know there's gotta be guys that come to you that they don't have the charisma that you have, they don't have the humor. So how do you teach these guys when personality is what you need to kind of lean into? Well, the truth is everybody has a personality, right? Unless you're like a bubble boy, everybody has a personality. But what it is, is people, they feel like kind of strangled by society. They're not being genuine and authentic. So they're changing the way they act in front of strangers, especially beautiful women. And then they can feel it and it's awkward. Yeah, and that's where the anxiety comes in. What you want to act is how you act with your family and friends. If you still tell stupid jokes, tell stupid jokes. You just want to act as if this person, this beautiful girl, is an old friend that you never met. Show her the personality that you show around family and friends. And for a lot of guys, unfortunately, they've associated negative feelings with that. And so they're not as confident, they're not as genuine, authentic, and so they hide their personality, which is also another way of saying that they're lying, they're being deceptive. And I'm saying, lift that veil of deception, lift that lie, stop lying to people about who you are, being honest and genuine and expressing that. It's just like, you know, especially Asian guys, like they have to learn how to express that more so because in Asian culture, we're not taught to be physically or emotionally expressive as mm -hmm. much. But again, you know, if you're, you know, joking around with your friends, you're being silly around your friends, be that. Be who you are around your friends and family. It sounds like it's not so much about being born with it. It almost seems like you're giving these guys tools to use and it's almost like they have to practice to get good to get good at this skill. Absolutely. Right. Well, you know, you can't be, you know, not everybody has the gift of being born good looking, but you can look good. Like fashion is a skill set. Style is a skill set. Communications is a skill set. Body language is a skill set. Just talking and bantering is a skill set. Like these comedians that go up on stage, you know, telling some of the funniest jokes. Um, they're not born with that humor. They had to develop it with time. They had to tell jokes. A lot of jokes didn't work, but they got to practice and practice and practice to the point where they're comfortable getting up at the stage, telling the story, hitting the punchline, right? Same thing with musicians, same thing with just like talking to girls. It's a skill set that you can learn. 
it is just much more complicated for guys because we have to learn so many different skill sets, right? Where it's like you have to have the confidence, so that's emotional self-regulation. You have to know what to say to the girl, right? You have to have good body language. You have to be funny. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to sit down, tell stories. You have to kind of be romantic where you're comfortable t touching her without being creepy. You got to know how to take her home or ask her on a date. You got to know how to text. This seems know so stressful. It, it's a lot, right? And what do girls have to do? Just exist? <laughs> well, you, you, you know, be we pretty. Cook. <laughs> be pretty. Like, do you guys like, care about cooking anymore? I think so. I mean, everybody has their own sort of priorities. Some people like uh, girls that are more traditional, right? Some girls, some guys don't care. Right. I think a lot of my Asian students, they want a girl for good head that takes care of themselves, probably educated, but doesn't necessarily have to take on the most like trad wife role, but isn't someone that is like, like the diametrically op opposition to that either. I wonder if we'll be moving towards like a trad wife, um, life, like pop trend, because I've seen a lot of TikToks where everyone wants to be a trad wife now. I wonder if we're moving in that well, direction. Well, the thing is, what, what do they used to call it? Just stay at home mom. Yeah. Right? Now trad wife is like a cool thing. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of, again, a lot of things you, you see full circle, but you know, whatever women want to do, like I completely respect that. Like I was raised by a single mom, right? I know the difficulty of like women, uh, you know, at least as, as, you know, the son of a single mom, like the struggle it is for a woman to make her way through a society that isn't, you know, going, that doesn't put you on a privileged pedestal. Like mm. my mom was like a Vietnamese immigrant, broken English, her college degree wasn't accepted in America, struggling making her way, and she did, right? So I recognize that, as I say, my male privilege, that it is much easier for me as a guy in certain respects, because again, I'm still like Asian, in certain respects, my life is easier as a guy than it is would be for a woman. That makes sense. So uh, today we wanted to talk about a few different topics. Um, since I am the elephant in the room, I am a white woman. Mm -hmm. Let's start with what's the difference between uh, white males dating Asian females versus the opposite? So we call it like WAMF and AMF. Right. And amps. Yeah. So you got the white male, Asian female, and then the Asian male, white female, or XF, right? It could be black, Latina. And the truth is, it's one of a sad statistic where 54% of American born Asian women will outmarry. They will not marry you as an Asian man, specifically because you're Asian. They're looking for typically like a white guy. Now, I understand, you know, there are a lot of laws that push that, you know, kind of marriage coupling very commonly. Um, the anti-mesignation law that forbade like Asian men to marry or the fact that a white woman that married an Asian guy might lose her citizenship, that happened. Um, and then the War Brides Act that pushed, you know, white guys or GIs to marry like Asian women. And you see this and it's just kind of built up, built up to the point where unconsciously a lot of like Asian women understand like if they marry a white guy, they're going to get a lot of white privilege. They can change their name all of a sudden. They're making more money. They're getting more job interviews. They're more safer in white spaces, right? Mm. It becomes a sign of white supremacy when they think like being Asian is bad, that it is inferior, all right? You can date whomever you want. If you want to date outside the race, you know, God bless you, Buddha bless you. Just don't throw your community, your race, your Asian American community under the bus doing it. Like I don't say to my Asian students, hey, Asian guys, you should date white women because Asian women suck. I've never said that. But there are quite a few, a minority, but they're vocal, but they're a minority that say like Asian women should date white men because Asian men are inferior, right? So who I tell my- Who says that, other coaches? I mean, like people in the Asian American community, like who are advocating like Asian women should be dating more white men. It's like a grooming effect mm -hmm. where they'll sell in like family gatherings, like, hey, you know, don't date a Chinese guy, don't date a Korean guy, like date a white guy because they're better than Asian guys. And so it's, it's, it's not It sounds like all this is women. creating a lot of animosity between Asian men and white men. I heard there's some, like a lot of different Reddit groups where they're mad about um, Asian women dating white men and they'll like post a photo of the couple and then the men will troll the, the white guy. Have you heard of those groups? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like part of what the Oxford study thing is. That's what, is, yeah, you were talking about. Yeah, where, you know, it, it's, it's a recognized phenomenon, right? Where like this trend is, is happening to the point where it is like overly obvious that it's based off of like white supremacy. And so 
I don't tell my Asian students to, you know, go do that, to, uh, to be angry about that. Because you can't change that. All you can change is what you do and what you feel. So instead of being obsessed about, like, whomever they're dating, be obsessed mm -hmm. about who you're dating and what you can pull, what you can do, right? Like, racism is going to change overnight, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, during COVID, the rise of anti-Asian racism increased, like, a thousandfold. Like, yeah, we had K-pop, but we had, like, COVID racism. So it was, like, two steps forward, one step back, right? Racism isn't going to disappear overnight. So to all my Asian brothers say, like, control what you can do. Date whomever you want. Increase your prospects of dating. Don't just date Asian women. You know, date all the women. You'll go from, like, 1% of the marriageable um, population to 16%. And that will just make you more successful in dating when you don't limit yourself to just one group of women. Why is the number so low? Why are only 16% of women suited for marriage? Well, that just comes from the website uh, where it looks at the demographic of like 18 to 29 uh, age who are single, not married, with and like a non-obese, you know, weight. It's just like, oh wow, they include the weight. Yeah, and so it just looks at the U.S. Census Bureau uh, data statistics, and that 60% of the population is in that uh, cohort. Well, I didn't know that they limit. They didn't think that obese women were not suited for marriage. Well, it's sort of like ask women, like what type of like how tall do they want their men to be? You're gonna see a lot of girls that that specifically do not want to date a guy that looks like me because I'm short. I'm five foot five, and that's okay. Everybody can have the preference. Mm -hmm. So if a woman ha has their preference, okay, you know it's fair for a man to have his preference. So when you're out um, with a bunch of students at a bar and you see a group of white women at a table and then you see a group of Asian women and you're about to go approach, are there different ways that you go about it or, and are there different reactions from each group? Yeah. So there's a difference between approaching Asian girls and white girls. With white girls, you can go with like the classic American style where the idea is like to display a lot of confidence, to be loud, to be funny, you know, just that command presence of is approaching her and you know the group and saying like, hey, I think you're beautiful, or you can go more indirect style, right? Engaging the group um, and sort of like controlling conversation long enough where you've ingratiated yourself um, before you like kind of switch to the girl that you're interested in because you want to befriend the entire group. You don't want to invite right. the group, right? When you approach Asian girls, it's more like you have to really be part of their social circle. They, you, they have to all give you their peer approval, right? They're, they're not gonna let you get with their friends. So they're more protective. Very protective, much more cliquish, if you will, right? And again, it kind of comes from like more of an immigrant survival instinct. So a random stranger comes in, they're gonna be more protective. Mm -hmm. um, although the exception is if you're a tall mid-white guy, like it, that barrier doesn't quite exist for them. So do you think they'll all fight over that guy? I mean, his, his odds are just going to be a lot higher. Obviously, th there's no one-size-fits-all answer to this, but what do you think is the key to attracting women? If you could just answer it in the quickest way possible. <laughs> Again, it, it is like every guy is going to be different and every woman is going to be different, right? I know that universally they say uh, women want a man that is confident. And yeah, that is absolutely true. But what is confidence, right? And it's going to vary by society. Mm -hmm. But here in America, confidence is how we project our personality from the inside to the outside. How comfortable we are with that person. Can we make them laugh? Can we display it through our body language? It is, if you can be comfortable with yourself, she will be comfortable around you. But how we do that, or how do we project that from the inside out? How do we make people comfortable around us? Again, body language or humor, or energy, or ability to tell stories about ourselves, or ability to connect with another human being, or lack of, like, say, sexual shame in that, uh, yes, I know I'm sexually desirable, and I find you sexually attractive, and we're both equal in this manner. So, you know, I think it is the ability just to treat people like someone you already know. You don't treat them like strangers. You treat them like an old friend. And you can make people comfortable around you and you can just ingratiate yourself at any kind of circle and talk to anyone that you want. What, who's been like, if you could think back on your experience, have you ever had a client that was uncoachable? I would, I hate to say this, but there are some students 
as Bruce Lee w would say, like their cup is full, right? Mm -hmm. It is just full of water. They have not emptied it. They think they know everything. They're not willing to learn. And it's unfortunate, like some guys are just that way. And it's a weird thing where they spend money, but they just don't want to learn. So they're not getting girls, but they still won't take advice. Exactly, right? Okay. Others have what I call this high expectation, but low pain threshold, low resilience, where mm -hmm. they want, oh, I want a Victoria's Secret model that can cook and clean and give the best blow jobs. But you know, the, the one time I get a girl say, no, I'm gonna you know, walk away and with my tail between my legs because he can't take the emotional pain. Like emotional pain, even though it's not real pain, it's not physical pain, the emotional pain, the discomfort that's just imagined in the brain is something he can't handle. And so mm -hmm. students that aren't willing to embrace the challenge, they see it as pain instead of like a challenge. I always say at the ABCs of Attraction, there are no obstacles, only opportunities to succeed. And so a student that just doesn't want to learn or isn't willing to embrace change, those are students that are going to be incredibly difficult to succeed. Have you noticed, because you've been doing, the, we've known each other for quite a bit, like maybe almost 10 years now, mm -hmm. have you noticed the dating game changing in LA in the last 10 years? Are people, are there more lesbians now? Like we <laughs> see it on TikTok more, like I've been hearing a lot of rumors that there's not as much polarity as there used to be between the masculine and the feminine, which is making it harder for people to find someone they're attracted to. Or is that just an internet myth? I would say there's definitely some polarization in dating over the past, like, you know, time. Um, obviously, part of that is just the information silos that we exist in. But again, like comparing whenever we travel, you know, the women, how they act towards Asian guys versus how like white American women act towards Asian guys. I hate to say this. And again, it is not all women. It's not all white American women, obviously. But it happens enough where... White American women are the same thing as white American men, just in a different font. Still, they're equally as entitled, toxic, and racist. Hey, now. <laughs> I know. I'm not, I'm not talking about you, Emily. But I'm just saying, like, I see this. And so, like, when online, like, women are like, oh, you know, I'd rather choose the bear than the man. It's like, okay. Like, it's, like, it's the same thing I see with white American women. Like, you're not that much different than white American men. Like overseas. It's the pot calling the kettle black. Yeah. It's just like, you're still white. You're still privileged. You're still entitled. You're still racist. Like, it's not that much different between the two. It's like, you're, it's just like, you're, you're both fighting for the top spot while not really making room for other people of color or other marginalized groups. And I'm, again, I'm not saying this is of all well, women, but, if, but if, I've seen this enough. And then you're saying it's hard because Asian women are wanting to date white men. So. Yeah. And it's it's making it harder for Asian men to date Asian yeah. women. So there's definitely like, you know, studies that have looked at the dating trends. And so they say like one out of five Asian American men will never marry. Right. Like almost mm. a full quarter. Like they're never going to get married. Like not because they don't want to, but because statistically speaking, it's just not going to happen for them. Has COVID changed the way people date after the pandemic? Are you noticing a shift in like how people get together because I know the party life has definitely changed. Yeah, there's been, definitely been a slight change in the dating culture after COVID. Um, like I said, you know, at least the Asian perspective, two steps forward, one step back. K-pop, you know, became super popular. At the same time, anti-COVID racism also expanded. But also more people are online. So I've never been a big proponent of like dating apps or Instagram. Right. But it's become way much more popular. So now we do teach like, like Tinder and as well as like Instagram. Like, well, technically Instagram isn't a dating app. We find like Instagram is in many ways better than like Tinder. There's not as much like, pressure. Yeah. And you can actually kind of like filter for the type of girls that you might find attractive. And so... It's, it's something that you can control more over. So we actually have created a program, um, the idea like where attraction can be part of like your physical attractiveness, your personality, you know, your game and your style. Here with Instagram and online, it's like you can add status, like the element of mm. fame. So we have like a VIP influencer program where we, we help guys actually sort of like achieve a certain amount of like fame and celebrityhood 
online and that that attracts girls too so is it a whole different game now that you ha- that now that you're teaching men how to get women on the internet because it's like you're it, you're a different person online some of these people and then they meet them well that's true of like all dating apps right, right. but again like one but of the you're questions- coaching it so it's like yeah. do you have to switch how you're because co- you're always like the master in person charisma yeah. I mean, I'm not the one, I teach the basics, like the Tinder one-on-one, but I have like coaches that teach the more higher level, like Instagram and dating apps. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day though, they still have to meet the woman, right? Yeah. (laughs) Right. And so like one of the questions we always tell the students is ask the girl, do I look better in person than I do online? If she says yes, then you know that your physical in-person presence isn't catfishing her like your confidence your ability you know your charisma is what she's finding attractive because you know she's gonna like yeah she has this perspective of what you were like on your photos but then when you meet her and you act in a confident fun genuine comfortable manner then that discrepancy sort of disappears and you're not catfishing we don't encourage them to catfish but you know you can like enhance your appearance right to just make yourself look good for sure oh yeah i mean i i wouldn't know anything about that (laughs) it is super common now it's more common overseas in asia that could be considered catfishing but I i think it's okay to like enhance your photos clean it up you know I always tell myself if I had a makeup artist and a hairstylist, this is what I would look like. So that's how I justify filtering photos. Yes, that's a great perspective. Like one of our coaches, he does like male modeling. Um, and he obviously when he does commercials and stuff like that, they put makeup on him. Mm-hmm. And that's completely normal. Right. So the idea is like you're going to take photos, you're going to take photo shoots. You want to look your best. It is harder for men to catfish. Women, we, we can change our hair, our color. We can change the shape of our face every day. Yeah, special angles. Yeah. You know, yeah. Do you warn guys when the photo's like this? Yeah, or the, the height angle. Yeah, for sure. So two more questions before we close out for today. What's your favorite date spot in Los Angeles? Oh, well, I can't tell you that. Oh, it's a secret? It's a secret. Okay. If I told you that, everybody would be going. The okay. Because, no, yeah, Fair like I said, I do a dating triangle. I, that's all I'll Okay, say. so then you're going to answer this one. Do you think it's too much to take a woman to dinner on the first date? Is it better to do drinks and apps? I tend to prefer drinks and apps, but I will do dinner. But part of it is like, I enjoy going to really nice restaurants, Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes I take a girl to dinner, not because I'm necessarily like romantically interested in her, but it's like, oh, this is a new restaurant, I'll do it. She seems cool, maybe I'm not super into her, but like, I'll pay for dinner. Like, and that's another thing, I will always pay for dinner. If you're gonna ask a girl on a date, pay for dinner, right? Yeah. Um, But I enjoy going to dinner. I enjoy going to nice restaurants, collecting Michelin stars, experiencing that. Would you encourage your clients to go to dinner or do you think that it's too much pressure for like a big formal dinner seems like such a commitment compared to just apps and drinks for some reason? Yeah, I think that would be dependent upon the student, like how advanced his game is. And yes, you have to really talk and engage yeah. at the dinner table. If he's someone that is advanced enough, like intermediate level, where he's able to hold down a conversation, um, be attractive, be funny, and can fill in those awkward pauses, and enjoys going on dinner, there's an opportunity there. But it, I would not say or recommend that to be the go-to date for like the majority, especially if you're a beginner. You know, drinks and appetizers is a classic. It works. You know, it's a, it's fun, but not too high investment where either one party feels like, hey, I've got to stay here for like hours and hours. Yeah. But it can lead into something. If the drinks are, you know, flowing, the apps are delicious, like, hey, maybe we'll go to this next spot. Is there any date idea that you would advise your clients not to do? <laughs> the classic movie date is not high school all over. <laughs> um, anything where they're you know, where you can't interact with them. You want the ability to interact physically and verbally, you know, touching. Um, so, like, what, what do they call it? Like, the, the dinners where you just put on, like, earphones. Like, those experiences, you don't want to do oh, that. Right. Maybe if they have a bad personality, that'd be a good idea. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm not sure you would want to go on one of those days. But, you know, we can't always judge a book by the cover, right? Have you ever had a client say they took a woman to a strip club on the first date? No, I've never done That'd that. That'd be pretty crazy. I've, I've, yeah, I mean, if, if she's into it, sure. I yeah. guess that she's, like, looking for a third partner. I don't know. Yeah. It just, like, it just likes the female form. What about beach walks? Too romantic? 
it might give that. I mean, obviously, if she's more of an athletic person, you could do the hike. There's something to be said. Like when you have like a little adrenaline rushing, they've done studies where when you have adrenaline rushing, that makes the partner more attracted to you. Oh, like all the chemicals released after you're done yeah, working out. Yeah, the endorphins, out. you know. So an activity date, right? You know, mountain climbing, rock climbing, going on the hikes. Only downside to that is sometimes you don't want to be, you know, all intimate when you've been hot and sweaty and you're like dirty right. and like, you know, the sand is getting into all the uncomfortable places. But th there's a case to be made that those dates can also be interesting too. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I'm excited to see what happens after this Euro and Latin tour. Um, have fun and we'll catch you guys next time. This is Emily Hagen, Emily Knows Everything with JT. Yeah, so again, my name is JT Tran, founder of the ABCs of Attraction. We're USA's number one Asian dating coach and we hold premium boot camps across the country, LA, New York, Dallas, where we teach guys like you the ABCs of Attraction in a holistic way of being confident and dating girls through inner game, outer game, and verbal game. And then we have our more advanced long-term training programs, but only if you graduate from boot camp because they're a lot more rewarding, but they're also tougher. So check us out at abcsofattraction.com. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching our video. I hope you liked it. And make sure you guys subscribe to this channel and watch all our other videos. Great news too. Every Monday, we'll be putting out a new weekly video. That's right, we've got educational seminars, street interviews, uh, fun infield pickup videos, and anything else we can come up with that's fun for you guys to watch. So check back.